Welcome to World War II Indiana Landmarks, Episode 12, The Indiana War Memorial. I'm your host, Ron May, author of the book, World War II Indiana Landmarks. Today, we travel to the heart of Indiana in downtown Indianapolis, where we find the Indiana War Memorial. This is the crown jewel of all the memorials in our state. It is located a few blocks north of the city center on Meridian Street between East Vermont and East Michigan Streets. The memorial anchors the south terminus of the Veterans Memorial Plaza and the American Legion Mall. From an aerial photo, you can see that there are two grassy areas that extend three blocks north of the memorial. Dressed in Indiana limestone and adorned with a pyramid crown, the memorial's large cube structure rises 210 feet from the ground. Its neoclassical architecture is reminiscent of ancient Greece, with its six ionic columns reaching high from the top of each side of the building. Each side of the memorial presents some unique features. Standing proudly on a base of pink granite on the south side of the Indiana War Memorial is the statue Pro Patria. Latin for the fatherland. The statue is of a young man draped in an American flag reaching heavenward. The statue is 24 feet high and weighs approximately seven tons. It was the largest sculptured bronze casting ever made in America at that time. Begun in 1926, the cornerstone for the memorial was laid on July 4, 1927 by General John P. Blackjack Pershing, the commander of the American Expeditionary Force during World War I. The Indiana War Memorial was finally completed and dedicated in 1933. Although originally built to honor the 150,000 plus World War I veterans from Indiana who served in that war, the memorial was rededicated in 1966, with some controversy, to also commemorate the 400,000 Hoosier veterans who fought in World War II and the 143,000 Hoosiers that served in the Korean conflict. Entering the war memorial, the visitor comes into a very ornate lobby with neoclassical columns and gilded ceilings. The Pershing Auditorium, straight ahead after entering the lobby, is named for General John P. Blackjack Pershing of World War I. It is the central and largest space on the main floor of the building. This ornate space, which includes 500 seats and a balcony, is trimmed in American red marble and treated with special acoustical tiles. Public and private events are held there throughout the year. On the east and west sides of the memorial's main floor are two large meeting rooms that accommodate up to 75 people. Both rooms are named after famous World War II military leaders with Indiana roots. Admiral Raymond Spruance, commander of the Naval Forces in the Pacific who grew up in Indianapolis, and Marine Corps General David Shoup, who led Marine Forces in the Pacific and later became the Commandant of the Marine Corps. He grew up in Covington, Indiana. Above the auditorium on the top level is the magnificent Shrine Room. It is accessed by elevator or by long stairwells on either side of the auditorium. If one's health and fitness level allow, it is preferable to climb the stairs to see the many thousands of names listed in alphabetical order in picture frames on either side of the stairway. These are the names of 150,000 Hoosiers who participated in World War I, as well as the thousands who were killed or missing in action from World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. The seemingly endless display of names provides a sobering scope to the sheer volume of young Hoosiers who served, many of whom suffered the ultimate sacrifice in our nation's service. Entering the Shrine Room, is like entering a sanctuary with stained glass, massive marble columns, and an altar of consecration. The central feature of the room is a huge American flag that hangs down beneath the star of destiny in stately grandeur. 
Standing beneath the flag and looking up at it inspires reflection on our nation and those who fought to preserve our freedoms. Beneath the flag, upon a black marble platform, is the altar of consecration, made from black and reddish-brown marble. It bears witness to the fallen heroes who have fought under the flag and for their country. While the shrine room inspires the visitor, the free museum at the lowest level of the building informs and educates those who take the time to walk through it. The many fine exhibits showcase chronologically the involvement of Indiana veterans in all our nation's wars, beginning with the Revolutionary War and extending to the more recent War on Terrorism. There is much to see and learn in the World War II gallery. It includes displays of uniforms, weapons, photos, newspaper headlines, paintings, and documents, as well as other interesting artifacts. One exhibit memorializes the service of Army Air Corps navigator Edgar Whitcomb, who later became Indiana's 43rd governor. The items in the corner exhibit include a painted portrait with a summary of his military service, a photo of him with General James Doolittle, the two books he wrote of his war service, and the sextant he used in his navigation while serving on a B-17. In 1958, Whitcomb published his first book about his war service and escape from the Japanese entitled Escape from Corregidor. Whitcomb also wrote a second book about his early military service entitled On Celestial Wings. Whitcomb was born in Hayden, Indiana in 1917. He came to Indiana University in 1939 intending to study law. With the outbreak of World War II, he left the university to serve in the Army Air Corps, becoming a navigator on B-17 B bombers. He arrived in the Philippines just a few weeks before the Japanese began their conquest in December 1941. When Whitcomb's base was overrun by the Japanese, he and other Americans were driven into the Bataan Peninsula for a last stand against the enemy. When the remaining American forces surrendered a few months later, Whitcomb was not one of them. He and two others managed to escape from Bataan in a rowboat and went to Corregidor, which still had a holdout of Allied forces. When Corregidor fell to the Japanese, again Whitcomb was one of several to escape from being taken prisoner. This time he did so by swimming for eight hours across the sea to get back to the mainland. He then began his long journey across Luzon, eluding Japanese forces as he and a small group made their way across the country before they were finally caught and imprisoned by the Japanese at Santo Thomas. Beaten and tortured, but still posing successfully as a civilian, Whitcomb and others were eventually sent to China and then India before reaching the homeland for repatriation. He arrived back in the United States in December of 1943, following a two-year ordeal of capture and escape. Whitcomb stayed in the service, eventually joining another bomber crew, and he eventually returned to the Philippines as part of the American invasion force in 1945, which retook the islands from the Japanese, helping to bring an end to World War II. After the war, Whitcomb served in the Army Reserves until 1977, when he retired as a colonel. Whitcomb returned to Indiana University and graduated from the law school in 1950, and the same year was elected to his first political office as a member of the Indiana State Senate. He later became Indiana Secretary of State and was elected the 43rd Governor of the State of Indiana in 1968. Adventurous and productive even in his later years, he remained in Indiana the rest of his life and died at the age of 98 in 2016. Two years before his death, a monument to him was dedicated in his hometown of Hayden, located nine miles east of Seymour. The Edgar Whitcomb Monument in Hayden, Indiana was dedicated in 2014. Consisting of a limestone wall with a raised outline of Indiana, 
A bronze sculpture of Whitcomb wearing a suit from the waist up is recessed into the state's outline. On either side of the main wall are two smaller limestone walls with bronze art pieces, one which memorializes his escape from Corregidor during World War II, and the other which pays tribute to his year-long feat of sailing around the world in 1996 at the age of 71. The monument is located on the lawn outside of the Hayden Historical Museum, which occupies the renovated house that Whitcomb grew up in. Just beyond the Whitcomb exhibit is a room that showcases the contributions of many of the companies throughout Indiana that made products for the war effort during World War II. Divided into regions of the state, information boards identify the companies and what they produced during the war. It's an impressive list. There are also displays of some of those products, mostly engines that were used in vehicles or planes produced here in Indiana. Upon exiting the memorial, there is a great view of the Veterans Memorial Plaza and the American Legion Mall stretching out for three city blocks. The grassy area has additional monuments. It also features memorials for World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. Learn more about the Indiana War Memorial and Edgar Whitcomb's service story in my new book, World War II Indiana Landmarks, available for purchase on my website or wherever books are sold. And while on my website, check out my trilogy of Indiana World War II Veteran Service Stories. Thanks for tuning in to this episode.